The Agenda with Steve Pakin is brought to you by the Chartered Professional Accountants of Ontario. CPA Ontario is a regulator, an educator, a thought leader, and an advocate. We protect the public. We advance our profession. We guide our CPAs. We are CPA Ontario. And by viewers like you. Thank you. It was clear to everyone that protecting vulnerable seniors and essential workers in long-term care would be a top priority if and when a second wave of COVID-19 hit. Now that the second wave is here, where do things stand? Tonight, for the full hour, we're looking into that. First, what experts think of how well Ontario prepared and what's top of the to-do list. Then, the Minister of Long-Term Care, Marilee Fullerton, responds. It's Wednesday, November 25th, and that's next on the agenda. By far, the most deaths from COVID-19 in Ontario have been seniors in long-term care. The situation was so bad, the province had to ask for the military to be called in. Now, with a second wave bearing down, have we done enough to protect those living or working in those settings? Let's get into that. And as is our custom on this program, we'll introduce our guests from furthest away to closest to our studio in that order. And so we start in Innisfil, Ontario, with Charlene Stewart. She's the president of SEIU Healthcare, the union that represents more than 60,000 frontline healthcare workers in this province. In Streetsville, Mississauga, Dr. Ahmed Arya, a palliative care doctor who works in long-term care facilities and holds a joint faculty appointment in the Division of Palliative Care at McMaster University in Hamilton and the University of Toronto. In the St. Lawrence Market neighborhood of the provincial capital, there's Donna Duncan, Chief Executive Officer at the Ontario Long-Term Care Association, and in the downtown core, Dr. Samir Sinha, Director of Geriatrics at Sinai Health and the University Health Network. And it's really good of all four of you to make some time for us and our viewers and listeners tonight here on TVO. I wanna start just by putting up some facts that will set up the discussion to come. And Sheldon, if you would, let's bring that graphic up. Long-term care deaths account for two-thirds of the deaths from COVID-19 in this province. There are 626 long-term care homes in Ontario, of which more than 400 have had outbreaks. Now, a reminder, one case is considered an outbreak. At the start of this week, 101 homes had outbreaks. That's about 16% of the province's homes. And as of Monday of this week, there were 528 residents and 467 staff members with the virus. Now, let's start with this. The province's official line is, yes, we're into a second wave of COVID-19, but we did learn a lot of lessons the first time around, and therefore we're doing much better this time around. I want to start with a basic question. True or false? Dr. Sinha, start us off. Well, I think, you know, the second wave, we're seeing more deaths again, we're seeing more outbreaks, and sadly, we're seeing a lot of the issues that weren't addressed in the first wave that are creeping back to, uh, to hit us again in the second wave. And I really think it's just unparalleled levels of community transmission and, and the staffing issues that really haven't been resolved that I think are the Achilles heel of a good pandemic response. That's why I think we're seeing outbreaks again and, and preventable deaths once again. Charlene Stewart, we're doing better this time, true or false? False. Um, for all reasons, they didn't do enough uh, preparedness over the summer. The things that they did were uh, verbal commitments, but we're not seeing the actions implemented inside the homes. Uh, we're seeing a uh, uh, more critical uh, staff shortage. It's been reported that 30% of the staff that were there during the first wave are not returning during the second wave. So it is worse. I mean, some of the lessons learned, like the um, you know low wages, there was a commitment to address that, but the piecemealing way that we're dealing with this pandemic is not making any improvements. Things are actually worse. Dr. Ahmed Arder, what do you say, true or false? Yeah, so absolutely, I would agree with the other panelists that um, our response has been piecemeal, ad hoc, and really far too late in many of the homes that have large-scale COVID-19 outbreaks. So really, it's false, and we could have done much better uh, over the summer and, and learned even from other provinces that had a much better response. Well, Donna Duncan, I've left you for the end for obvious reasons. I wanted you to hear what everybody else had to say first. How do you weigh in on this? 
Uh, certainly, we're better off in knowing about asymptomatic spread and PPE and testing, but we have a critical staffing shortage right now, and we still have old buildings, and we know that the root cause is in wave one, where, where we had uh, community spread, and old buildings, and staffing shortages. So we have a lot to do to still stabilize the sector. Tell me what you think, uh, Donna, has changed in terms of how long-term care homes are better prepared this time around than during the first wave. What's different now? Certainly the response for help with help is, is much faster this time in, in the first wave. It wasn't until the middle of April that we were able to get reinforcements in. Uh, certainly we've been working with the government to say, it, we can't wait days, we can't wait weeks, we can't wait months. When we know that we have an outbreak that may be escalating, we need to get help as quickly as possible. And certainly working it with public health and with uh, hospitals and local communities, where especially where we have large uh, outbreaks, uh, that helps going in more quickly. And we need that. Samir, we know that when the Canadian military was called in earlier this year, uh, that report uh, really revealed some pretty horrifying stuff. In fact, I think Premier Ford said at the time it was the scariest report he'd ever seen. Uh, Heart-wrenching, I think, actually, is more accurate of what he said. Uh, in your view, since then, what's changed? There's been a greater recognition about how vulnerable long-term care homes are. And uh, as you mentioned, that we've seen the majority now have experienced an outbreak. Um, and we've seen over 2,300 deaths now occurring, you know, in these settings. So this is, this is a real challenge that we've really had to struggle with. But I think the key is that the government is making commitments. Uh, you know, they're saying we recognize that we have to improve staffing. We recognize that we need more supports for the sector, that we have to actually increase the levels of care we're providing. The key is, is that, uh, you know, how do we actually make those structural commitments happen quickly and in in a timely way and 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 really change the overall culture of long-term care where we saw in that military report staff talking about a culture of fear staff being told by some operators don't use the ppe it's too expensive for example um and a culture where where staff just feel that they're not being supported so charlene said 30 percent one in three of the hundred thousand staff members that you know were working perhaps you know in our homes in the first wave are not returning. That's a huge problem. And that really tells us that a lot of people, the staff included, are, are losing confidence in the sector. And we have to change that quickly. Charlene, how much of that happens? How much of, of staff being told, don't use PPE, it's too expensive, use it, you know, use it sparingly. How much of that do we really hear? Yeah, unfortunately, it still does happen. And again, with the outbreaks, the ability to get a hold of um, Higher grade, like N95s, is still a challenge. Uh, the infection prevention control measures in the homes, because of the crisis in the staffing, uh, is not good enough. They've got staff working on multiple floors, uh, using the same mask that they've used on, say, an infected floor. Uh, because of the staffing shortages, they have to spread those staff uh, among many floors, and that is a bad way to contain a virus or a presumed virus. You know, having said that, Ahmed, I, I do remember Brian Mulroney once saying, don't compare me to the almighty, compare me to the alternative. So let's find out, relatively speaking, how Ontario is doing vis-a-vis -vis other provinces. On that score, what do you find? Well, I think really the gold standard that we can compare ourselves to is British Columbia, which acted very early on in the pandemic back in March to take critical actions. They acted decisively with clear communication for the entire long-term care sector, specifically when it came to public health supports, infection control and uh, prevention, along with staffing. What they did is they nationalized the long-term care sector, which means that the government actually hired all frontline long-term care workers, made sure that there were only working in one home, being paid a decent living wage, benefits and sick leave. And consequently, through the first wave, what happened is, is that they have half of the long-term care sector, but had one-tenth of the deaths. And here in Ontario, we still have this loophole in the directive where agency staff can actually still move between homes. Hmm. Uh, I've heard conflicting things. Donna, maybe I should go to you on this. I've heard conflicting things on ownership style as to whether or not a home owned by the public, operated by the public, as opposed to privately, makes a difference in outcomes. What can you tell us on that? 
So certainly, uh, Steve, the research that we've done would demonstrate that if, if there is no difference with ownership, ownership is not a factor. And, and certainly in this way, we, we are seeing municipal and, and not more nonprofit homes being impacted by this. Uh, the, the key indicators are community spread, old buildings, staffing shortages. Uh, these these are really the, the critical root causes. And we need to focus on, to, to Samir's point, what are the how are we going to fix these issues right now and quickly and restore confidence in this sector so that we can ensure that we've got the staff we need to keep our residents safe? Ama, can you come back on that? I, I, again, I, I have heard the same conflicting things about whether uh, the, um, the ownership style matters. Uh, you seem to say in British Columbia that it does. Does it really? Yeah. So, I mean, of course, it's not the only factor. And, uh, you know, Donna is absolutely right that there are sort of uh, homes that are not for profit or municipal that are having a hard time and actually weren't providing proper care even before the pandemic. And there's very good for profit homes as well. But uh, of course, for profit status um, is a critical issue that has come up during this pandemic and it needs to be addressed. I mean, we know that private for profit homes had a poor quality of care in general before the pandemic with a higher rate of hospitalizations and deaths. And they also disproportionately have more deaths at this time during the second wave and the first wave. Charlene, where do you come down on this issue of whether ownership mode matters? Uh, absolutely. I mean, over this first wave, we've got lots of data, lots of statistics. Um, it's proven that the for-profit homes have 17% fewer staff, and that was before the pandemic. It's worse now. So the facts are there. I don't agree with Donna. I mean, uh, the for-profits, yes, of course, there's been some good ones, but strangely enough, the ones that were spared during the first wave are seeing the infections now. And, you know, the data is all there. They do hire fewer staff. And that's the uh, result of the uh, consequences of how many infections and deaths uh, appeared inside those for-profit homes. And again, right now there is support coming in, but where is it coming from? The public sector. Hospitals are coming in to support those homes. So uh, we need to make that a permanent way of delivering care, not just when there's a crisis going on in health care or in long-term care. Samir, just before I get you to comment on that, let me, Sheldon, uh, our director, Sheldon Osman here, can I call an audible? Let's go to bottom of page three and bring up this graphic here from the Toronto Star analysis from earlier this month. Because here's what the Star found when they looked into this. They discovered that among homes with at least one confirmed infection since August 1st, the Star's analysis shows for-profit homes have struggled to stop the spread of the virus. Residents in for-profit homes have been more than three times as likely to catch COVID-19 as those in a non-profit facility, and for-profit have seen more than twice as many staph infections per bed. Resident deaths have been more common too. Now, what that analysis I don't think suggests, or what it doesn't indicate, is whether or not these are older for-profit homes versus newer not-for-profit homes. It suggests that the ownership model is the reason for these higher rates. What can you tell us on that? Well, what we do know is uh, a colleague of mine, Dr. Stahl and others, actually were working in partnership with the ministry to do a study. And, and Donna and the Minister of Long-Term Care, uh, Marilee Fullerton, have talked about the study. And what it really showed was that community transmission is the biggest risk factor that will determine whether a home gets into outbreak, regardless of ownership status. But what the clear signal from the papers were showing was that actually if you were a for-profit home, you were more likely to have a larger outbreak and a larger number of deaths. And largely, a lot of the factors here were related to chain ownership. So if you're part of a big chain, um, and if you actually, and, these, and, and many of these chains actually own older homes. So we have to remember that one in three people living in an Ontario long-term care home is actually living in a four bedded room. And these are buildings that are over 50 years old that have not been developed. Many of the not-for-profit and municipal providers have actually redeveloped their beds, so they're up to modern standards. But oh, about 50% of the for-profit beds in Ontario have not been redeveloped. Uh, and that's a problem because then you're, you're packing people into crowded rooms. And there hasn't been a lot of movement, frankly, over the past few months in actually decrowding um, these, uh, these homes. We've kept continued to admit people uh, and unfortunately, we still have people four to a room and that's why in the second wave some of the biggest spectacular outbreaks yet again are in these older 
crowded homes where they were literally like kindling that we just threw a match in and we knew that this was going to happen. We had the data. We didn't actually act definitively and especially around the staffing issues. These are the challenges and this is what the data told us that we needed to do. Okay, but Charlene, I'm going to go back to you one more time on this thing because this is the thing I'm really trying to get to the bottom of. Is it the ownership model itself, the private versus not-for-profit, that is the issue here or is it the fact that many of the as Dr. Sinha puts it, many of the places where it's like kindling happen to be privately owned, but that's not the issue. It's actually the fact that it's four to a room, it's that they're older, all of those issues. Help us understand. Yeah, well, it's a combination of all of that. But again, it's so simply put, it goes, definitely goes back to staffing. I mean, building new homes, yes, they're needed. But again, if you do not have the staff, to work in those homes, then we're still going to have the same problem existing. Uh, the fact that uh, the for-profit homes, I mean, take a look at the, they, they take uh, the public money that's given to them to take care of seniors. They take from that money and they pay the shareholders. Now, that, that means that there has to be cut somewhere. Where's the first place that they do it? They do it in staffing. And why aren't they taking a look at improving some of their own structures as well? So again, I say, it's a combination of all of it, but still, the shiniest new model without proper staffing, we're still going to have problems. Okay, I do want to pick up on that issue, that issue of staffing, and Donna, I'll go to you first on this one. We learned 17 years ago with SARS that one of the best ways to encourage a virus to be as contagious as possible was to have, um, uh, you know, personal service workers and long-term care home workers work in as many homes as possible. And so the recommendations came out one worker per one home, and that's how you nip this thing in the bud. What I need to know today is whether or not that protocol is being followed across the province of Ontario. Do we still have one PSW per long-term care home, as has been recommended for 17 years? Well, certainly in the first wave, we moved to one, one single site for staff. Uh, I, I believe Amit mentioned that uh, agency staff are not subject to that, but but with uh, this wave, it, we really are uh, abiding with that. Uh, as Charlene says, we do have a critical staffing shortage right now, and we are working very, very hard with government to try and uh, boost our, our reserves, I would say. Uh, but because uh, if, we, if we don't have people, we can't keep people safe. Amit, do we have a situation in Ontario today where it's one staff worker to one home only, or are they still working in multiple homes, or too many still working in multiple homes? Well, the honest answer is we don't know because this is not being tracked by the ministry, but it's obvious that this would increase the spread of the virus. And as uh, Charlene and Dr. Sinha have said, I mean, we're in the middle of a critical staffing shortage at this time, and we should have done so much more through the summer to make sure that all health workers in these homes were full time being paid a decent living wage and were only working in one home. Conditions of work determine the conditions of care. Charlene, I saw the Premier stand at the podium during one of his daily briefings and say we're going to offer lump sum benefits to people who go into the personal, service, personal support worker profession. Uh, we're going to up their pay. We're going to do what we can to make sure they only work in one home, one location per person. Is, is that not having an impact? It's having a negative impact, quite honestly. I mean, the fact that the full, like the permanent workers that were there uh, before the pandemic 68% of them have reported to us that they are financially in worse condition than they were before. In their words, they're being exploited, and the, predominantly it's women. They are making less money than they did pre-pandemic because they are confined to one home. One of the things I encourage the government to do is, like BC, keep them whole, give them a universal wage rate, and give them full-time work. The fact that the agency staff do not have to follow the same rules and, and conditions as the permanent staff, and I'm not saying full-time, but the permanent staff in there is a real problem. So this has not attracted, as I said, 30% of these workers feel like they are just uh, being left out. And to say that we'll give you a wage increase, to recognize that you are poorly paid, but we're only going to do it for six months and then put you back into poverty, they're not accepting that anymore. And then instead of increasing the wages, they're introducing lower paid, uh, lower trained staff to come in there. They're going backwards. That Everybody is racing to the bottom instead of dealing with the issue. Uh, stop exploiting these predominantly women, pay them what they're worth, give them full-time jobs with benefits, and watch and see how the system improves itself. Samir Sinha, out of the corner of my eye, I saw you nodding through much of that. What can you add to that? 
Well, I mean, you have to look at the different approaches. Quebec announced back in May they lost 10,000 frontline workers, you know, personal support workers. So they went out deliberately. They said, we're going to promise full-time work. We're actually going to hire. They hired 10,000 people. They recognized that for these women, you know, to actually take a few months to do training, you know, how are you going to put food on the table? So they paid them for their time and training, and then they guaranteed them a wage rate of at least $26 an hour. And that actually acquired 10,000 new frontline staff by September. And we actually have less homes in Quebec currently uh, in outbreak. And we had more homes in Quebec in outbreak uh, at the, uh, than Ontario uh, during the first wave. And now we flip that uh, course. So there are key ways in which we could actually stabilize our staffing. BC, Quebec, and BC is even hiring 7,500 new workers. But as Charlene said, what they did was they guaranteed everyone single site, full-time pay. And they made sure that everyone was being paid an equal top level rate. Uh, and that really did favors because that cost BC $10 million a month. So $120 million a year. And Donna can correct me if I'm wrong, but I think we spent $1 billion, you know, in Ontario to try and shore up our long-term care homes. And frankly, we have 2,300 people dead 10 times what BC has. So, you know, do the math and see how half-assed, you know, kind of limited approaches, you know, don't really get us that far. Donna, you want to weigh in? Well, absolutely. We, we we have a lot of work to do in on our staffing, and we saw what was happening in other provinces that throughout the summer months. Uh, we, we lost time. Yeah, we lost time. We need to stabilize the workforce. We need to respect those employees who've stayed and worked through. Bonuses for people who are new coming in doesn't recognize uh, the work and the commitment of our frontline staff who've worked in our homes for years. We need to validate them. We need to make sure that we're getting these new uh, compensation models in place to Charlene's point we've had lots of announcements but we haven't seen the cash flow well okay let me follow up on that Donna if we I mean I'm certainly sensing a consensus here about what it would take for improvement if we know what it would take why are we not doing it it's a great question. Uh, certainly, we've been advocating and working with our colleges uh, over the summer months. How do we build in uh, uh, experiential learning into our homes? Why can't we have uh, paid positions for PSW students to come in and learn on the job and get their both their practical and academic learning in the home in real time? Why can't we do that? Uh, What's the answer? Why can't we do that? I don't have the answer. I wish I knew. I've been asking because it, it seems uh, other provinces have done it. We've certainly done it in other sectors. Uh, if there's a will, there's a way. And, and let's just uh, clear out the weeds and make this happen. Hmm. Okay, Amit, let me find out from you. What are you hearing from residents today in long-term care homes in this province about how relatively safe or unsafe they feel now? Well, they're very scared, uh, you know, because some of the critical changes that we needed to have happen haven't happened. I mean, I'm a palliative care physician who works frontline in these long-term care homes and has worked in uh, homes with large-scale COVID-19 outbreaks. And a fundamental problem that happens when homes go into outbreak is that, that you have this virus, which is, of course, spreading very rapidly. And this virus causes, uh, I mean, it can cause rapid decline uh, in residents in terms of their health, where they can develop breathlessness or delirium and they need close monitoring. And basically, they need more care and not less during, during an outbreak. And that's not happening because what happens is, is that the staffing levels plummet at that time because many of the staff, unfortunately, fall ill themselves and are sick at home and, you know, and isolating. And as someone who's led these response teams into homes, I mean, what we really saw is that there just weren't enough staff in these homes. And we actually need a reserve force ready to step in at the first sign of any trouble in these homes, whether it's a, you know, a hospital response response team or community-based medical teams, um, you know, the threshold for intervention has to be very low and we have to do all we can to protect the well-being and lives of, of our seniors. Amit, Quebec got 10,000 new people pretty much uh, with the snap of a finger. What do we need in Ontario? How many? Yeah, so, I mean, I think we absolutely need to do much more. I mean, uh, I can tell you that experts and family caregivers, advocates and researchers have been calling for decades for four hours of uh, hands-on direct care per resident per day. And, you know, the average prognosis, the average life expectancy in these long-term care homes is 18 months. And our province's commitment is to make that happen in four to five years. I mean, how do you think that makes, uh, you know, residents and family caregivers feel? I mean, it's atrocious. We need to step up. 
up and have permanent funding and a timeline to make this happen now. I mean, this is an emergency, right? You know, what's really happening is, is that there's not enough staff to do critical duties like bathing and feeding and also monitor people medically. So there needs to be much more proactive action and investment. And if we talk about the tragedy that's happened and we say never again, that means action has to happen today. Samira, I do want to follow up on this issue of four hours of on uh, hands-on care um, per day, per resident. Uh, again, I saw the Premier go to the podium during one of his daily briefings and commit to making that happen. Now, he didn't say it would happen tomorrow, but he did say that they would get there soon. What's the status of that promise right now? Well, here's the challenge. Right now, in an Ontario long-term care home, we provide about 2.75 hours of direct hands-on care a day. And it was actually the Ontario uh, government's own staffing commission that came out back in, I think, about June-ish and actually said four hours a day is where we need to go. The long-term care commission um, was not asked to make any recommendations at all You know, from their work. They came out with interim recommendations a week before the budget and said, stop studying the study, move on four hours a day. I was thrilled when I saw the pre-budget announcement saying we're going to do it. We're going to move by 2024, 2025, four hours a day. And then budget day happened. Not a single dollar for that line item. Premier was asked what's going on. They said we're committed to it. Um, the Minister of Finance said we'll get the money when we need it. Well, you can hear we need the money now. And I think even if we just said, because this is a $1.6 billion top up on what we currently fund to reach that four hours a day. So we, you know, if we have the money, and I, apparently we have lots of money lying around, let's get this done so that we're not struggling and having the same conversation for wave three. Well, let me do a follow up with you on that because you're quite right. There was nothing specific. There was no specific line item in the budget that said this is for four hours hands-on care per resident per day. But the finance minister did say, I will find the money when we are ready to go. He's got $3 billion in a contingency account, not to mention $9 billion in another fund that he got from the federal government. What's holding this up, do you think? I have no clue. I mean, right now you hear, um, we actually have... Uh, we have staffing shortages all over the place. I know that about 80% of our homes were struggling with staffing before the pandemic started. And the average uh, time that a person spends working on the front lines in long-term care is uh, sometimes about 18 months. You know, So we're, we're not doing a great enough job and we're just burning through staff and, and burning up goodwill. And the challenge is, is that now we did some surveys over the summer through the National Institute on Aging, and we found that 78% of Ontarians say they rather receive care in their own homes than in a long-term care home. 100% of people 65 and older say, I wanna stay at home for as long as possible. I think the public have frankly been losing confidence in our long-term care system and I think our staff are too and that's hard to reclaim over time. So there's no time like the present to get started. Donna, what's your understanding of where the four-hour commitment is at today? Uh, they're planning. It's uh, the ministry's planning. They're certainly working on how to get that first uh, first extra hour of care in place uh, to Samira's point. Our challenge is going to be getting the people to provide that care. It takes us four years to train a nurse. Uh, we know that the environment matters as well in terms of getting our staffing in, and, and this is going to be matter. It takes three to five years to build a new home. Uh, we need to grow people and new buildings, and we need to restore confidence. The population over 80 in Ontario is going to double in the next 15 years. And uh, unfortunately, not everyone going to have that be able to age at home and so we know we've got to get the pieces in place but we need to get through wave two and be ready for wave three uh, and we need to attract a new workforce as quickly as possible and 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 upskill the one that we have to charlene's point uh we need more skills not less and we need more people charlene this is a government that that frequently says you know, we are tearing down regulations. We are damning the torpedoes, if you like. We are making sure that we can get this stuff done lickety split in lightning fast record time. Do you see that happening? No. And that's why workers are leaving. They have no confidence in the words that come out of the Premier's mouth anymore. They're nice words, but the action, they don't see it. Uh, it's those frontline workers, predominantly women, who are carrying the burden of this crisis, and they're not going to do it. I mean, four hours of care, yes, we, it's been decades that we've been asking for that. But again, there's not enough staff to even provide those four hours of care. So to say it, 
and not be able to implement it is um, just adding to the lack of competence these workers are having. One of the residents said he'd be dead by the time that there was an increase in that. And with the levels of care increasing in senior care, we might need five hours in four and five years, not four. So it needs the political courage and will to do things now. Dr. Sinha, maybe you could just explain, because, you know, when you look at the numbers, if you go from 2.75 hours per resident per day of hands-on care to four hours a day, that may not, you know, from 2.75 to four, may not look like a big increase. But let's understand that. What can you do in four hours that you can't do in two and three quarter? Well, it's the idea that when you th think about the typical resident in a long-term care home in Ontario, the average age is about 85, 90% have cognitive impairment, 70% have, uh, have dementia. Um, and we, we talk about, you know, having challenges with bathing, dressing, feeding, toileting. These are people who need incredibly high levels of care. And right now, with 2.75 hours of care, a lot of things just aren't getting done. And we hear this repeatedly. And, 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 um, and Dr. Aria was just mentioning how, for example, when there's an outbreak, you know, and there's even less staff available, just less things get done, like feeding, dressing in an appropriate way. So what we have to recognize is that the complexity of the residents who are living in these settings has increased. And so this means we need more frontline personal support worker time. We need more RPN time. We need more RN time. This is the time that we need. And frankly, you know, and we're talking about tens of thousands of workers that would actually need to make up that core our commitment. But again, I don't understand why Quebec, our province next door, could go out and in three months staff up 10,000 new people. They showed it could be done. So I'm not sure why we need to continue thinking and planning. And as the Long-Term Care Commission said, stop studying the study, just get on and do it. Because frankly, we're seeing we have 300 more people dead now in the second wave. Um, and uh, I don't know when we're going to finally pull the trigger and put out a shingle and say, we're hiring, we're ready, let's get this done. Well, I'm a, we've got the Minister of Long-Term Care coming on right after you four. Uh, I'm all ears as to questions you might, you might want me to ask her or what you've got on your wish list for her. Uh, fire away. Well, I think there's a lot of things that we've all talked about today that are so important. I mean, we've got to make sure that we address the staffing crisis. I mean, that's the first step that we all agree on and we've, we've spoken about. I mean, the you know, all the health workers need to only be working in one home. They need to be full time. Um, they need to be given a decent living wage, uh, sick leave and benefits. We need to move to the four hours um, um, of, uh, you know, care standard that everybody has been asking about. We also need to make sure that we enshrine the rights of essential family caregivers uh, under the law to make sure that what happened in the first wave where people couldn't even see their loved ones for six months never happens again. Uh, we have to make sure that we have hospital and uh, community-based medical teams on standby, ready to step in with a very low threshold of intervention. And for that to happen, we need full transparency from all homes about what's going on inside so that that critical help can be provided. We need to hold um, all long-term care homes, especially private for-profit long-term care homes, uh, accountable for tax dollars spent as well as quality of care and you know I'll, I'll be honest with you you know you know like with everyone listening and watching today that I think at this point in the pandemic months in we just keep on hearing numbers and deaths day after day but these people are much more than cold hard numbers I mean they're human beings there's somebody's you know parent grandparent aunts and uncle I mean th they have real life stories that we can all learn from and they deserve absolute dignity and respect at this time I mean we have to redesign our whole long-term care system to make sure that we give seniors you know the life they deserve uh, you know the life they deserve and the time is now. That's a good exhaustive list. Charlene, what would you add to that list of things that I should be asking the minister about when she comes in after this? Well, again, I mean, well said. We just absolutely have to stop the exploitation of women in long-term care. We have to provide them. And like we heard, the conditions of, of work definitely do uh, reflect the conditions of care. And until we respect the workers in there for the work that we do, pay them full-time wages, give them benefits and sick time, give them one job. That'll see, as I said, tremendous results. And again, it takes the political will to do it, to stand up to power the for-profit corporations and say, no, we're going to put the senior care, give it the respect and dignity it deserves. As 
uh, the doctor said, these senior citizens have given to our country. We need to give it back to them. Got about a minute left here. Let me give 30 seconds to Dr. Sinha and 30 seconds to Donna Duncan. Go ahead, Dr. Sinha. Yeah, I would just say, you know, I think we have a very dedicated minister for long-term care, and I really would just say, what's holding her back from, from getting these things done? What does she think that she needs from all of us to get action now? Because we have our list, and, and I want to know what's the barrier for her to do these things. That I will ask. Okay, Donna Duncan, last word to you. Yeah, just to uh, echo Samir's, how, how can we help? Uh, we need to, if we're going to do this, we, we, we all have to do it together. And certainly we've heard uh, a lot of common refrains today. Uh, let's uh, build a process, put a stake in the ground, say by this date, this will happen. Uh, clear out all of the impediments and let's just go. So let's, what does she need from us to make that happen? We're here to help. I want to thank four of the most thoughtful voices on this issue for gathering for us tonight on TVO. Charlene Stewart, Amit Arya, Donna Duncan, Samir Sinha. It's great of all of you to share so much time with us and our viewers this evening. Take care, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. The province pledged in April and again this fall to put a so-called iron ring of protection around seniors in long-term care in Ontario. But as the second wave forces lockdowns and rising hospitalizations, that's a tall order. And one that falls to Marilee Fullerton. As Minister of Long-Term Care, she's been on this file since assuming the role a year and a half ago. She is the PC MPP for Kanata Carleton and joins us now from her office at Queen's Park. Minister, good to see you again. How you doing? Good to, good to see you too. I'm, I'm doing okay. We're just continuing to, to do what we need to do and uh, to serve Ontarians. And, and our number one priority is keeping our residents and staff in long-term care safe. It's absolutely our number one priority. Well, let's start there. What did you learn from the outbreak in the spring that you can now say we've applied that knowledge to the fall, to the second outbreak, and therefore, in your view, things aren't as bad now as they might otherwise be. Well, this has been an unprecedented situation across the globe and a new virus that uh, was unknown to the scientists and the experts. And certainly the information that we've been able to gather from our medical experts has been extremely helpful uh, dealing with uh, not only in the first wave, but in the, making things better in the second wave. So that would be looking at the way this spreads, you know, the asymptomatic nature in some cases posed a real problem in the first wave. Uh, we needed more testing. Uh, the, the PPE was uh, a challenge globally, and we've advanced in, in so many ways from first the first wave. Our PPE supply is solid, manufactured here in Ontario. Our testing is robust. Uh, we're doing the asymptomatic uh, testing for staff and people coming into long-term care to make sure there's not a single case that comes in. And our testing isn't perfect, and that's why we're continuing to, to refine it. And you may have heard the, the news about the rapid testing that has, uh, has been made available now, and that's rolling out. But it's also really important to emphasize the integration. The integration of long-term care into uh, the uh, entire healthcare system as an integral part uh, with acute care. And what we've seen um, in the first wave with the, you know, the, the rapid effect that COVID had uh, and the impact that it had on long-term care, the ability to get the expertise uh, from the acute care sector, whether it was infection prevention and control, whether it was some, you know, and when you see the cavalry coming in, in, your, in a situation like our long, some of our long-term care homes we're in, to see that um, support for staffing, the rapid response teams uh, that were coming in and helping, and that integration with our experts and bringing the, the IPAC control, as I said, but also just to know that um, there's a better understanding of how important long-term care is to our acute care sector. And so that integration was key and the public health experts um, above and beyond everyone really trying to make a, a very difficult situation uh, improved. Okay, and let me see if I can... In, in wave two. Sure, let me see if I can unpack some, uh, some of the issues that you've raised in that answer. Sure. You talk about yeah. the cavalry coming in and, and uh, you know, you weren't just being facetious there. The, the Canadian forces mm -hmm. actually did have to come in mm -hmm. And there were horrible conditions that were uncovered, and uh, the Premier himself said he was heartbroken at what was discovered in the military's mm -hmm. report, a lack of cleanliness, neglect of residents, and so on. What specifically has been done to ensure no repeat of all of that? 
Uh, absolutely. And, you know, what we saw is with the staffing, and when the staffing were getting sick or they were afraid, uh, because uh, we really needed to make sure we had a solid supply of PPE, and it just that the challenges were extreme in the first wave. So, again, we have the PPE available, the N95 masks. We are able to shore up our staff. There's no home at the moment with any critical shortage of staff, and, and that's key because when you start to see the staffing um, uh, fall, that's when you get the poor resident outcomes. And well, let so, me pick up on that yeah. because... Um, you won't be surprised to hear that not everybody sees it that way. We just had four guests on the program before you've come on, uh, all of whom have painted a very different picture. Uh, and these are all people you know, and they're leaders in their fields. And they have said, for example, staffing is still in crisis. They have said, for example, that, that um, staff at some long-term care homes have been told, please uh, go easy on the PPE. We don't have enough and you may have to reuse it or don't use it as often as you might think you need to. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, we have still, uh, we're a long way away from four hours of uh, hands-on care per resident per day. Uh, anyway, well, anyway, I, I, I could go through a longer list, but let's start with mm -hmm. those things there. They're seeing a very different scenario than what you've just described. What's the disconnect? We're in, we're in continuous uh, contact with our long-term care homes multiple times a day uh, with updates on information and responding to that. Uh, the PPE, we, a number of weeks ago in our $540 million package, which included uh, in infection prevention and control, staffing supports, it included eight weeks of supply for our long-term care homes of PPE and understanding the nature evolving of, of this virus as well um, in terms of the concerns that uh, making sure that N95s were available to homes in outbreak. So this is something that's been ongoing. Uh, and uh, we know that the staffing is holding. It is not like the first wave. And we also learned from the first wave how quickly um, a home can get into trouble. It can be fine at the beginning of the week, and then in a few days, it's in crises. And so this integration that I speak of, making sure that our hospitals are in integrated and aware early, that we are getting community support, whether it's community paramedics, or in some cases in the Ottawa area, it was the Red Cross, um, and making sure those staffing supports are put in uh, at the earliest possible time so to, to make the best use of those resources. So our homes are holding in terms of the staffing, and, and I'll be uh, absolutely clear, we were in a staffing crisis going into COVID, and that's something that we were doing um, actively working on for longer term and immediate, um, and in terms of COVID, the emergency situation. So it's really a multi-layered approach. We, have, we can't stop with the long-term strategy because that's something that we're going to need down the road as we build capacity. But understanding that there are sometimes urgent measures that have to be taken, whether it's the mandatory management orders or the voluntary management contracts, these things have to be done quickly. And uh, we even uh, changed the definition of an outbreak. So it includes even just one staff member who's uh, isolating at home to make sure that we could get all the public health resources in right away. So the vast majority of our homes um, have no resident cases. And uh, this is it's definitely improved since the, the first wave. But we're continuously learning, adapting to new information, working with our public health experts uh, to, to keep up with the, uh, the changing information. But looking at the, the staffing, it's absolutely critical that we listen to our, um, our staffing, our expert staffing panel that made several recommendations. We're working on those. We're doing the rapid uh, return of uh, rapid training, mass training, um, working with other ministries, colleges and universities, with Ministry of Health, with the Ministry of Labor uh, on training and skills development um, to understand how we can make sure that we maximize the use of the staff that we have now. Uh, the return, um, resident uh, support aids was a new program that we also brought in. So, so this is ongoing, and we're using every measure, every tool. And as new evidence emerges, we use that too, such as the uh, the new tool of, with the rapid testing. And uh, that we're we're getting that out to our homes. Uh, there are six homes right now who have it. We're getting it out to another 30. Um, and but this has to be coordinated as well because it's a new uh, new tool, and we have to understand and make sure that we are understanding any pitfalls to it. Uh, and uh, addressing that as we go. But this has to be done. All of this has to be done in COVID time. COVID doesn't wait. And that's why one, one case into a home 
um, can be devastating. And no, I, I grant you. Wanna... And, and uh, you know, in, in the interest of fairness, we did point out in the earlier segment that there are outbreaks in about 16% of the province's long-term care homes right now. 16% is not the majority. It's a long way from the majority. So we do understand that. But, but these four observers, and, and they're, they're players in the system, these are not just newspaper mm -hmm. critics, these are players in the system, say that we're still nowhere near being where we need to be on the issue of, for example, one PSW or one support worker per home and that's it. That, that the province is still not paying what was considered a living wage to these people so they, could only work, so they only have to work in one home and not go to multiple homes as agency reps often have to do. Why have you not been able to make any progress on that? Well, we brought in the pandemic pay fairly early. Again, this had to be coordinated um, with uh, the PSWs that work in other sectors, whether it's uh, the uh, Ministry of Seniors uh, and Accessibility or um, in terms of children's developmental uh, uh, programs and understand how one area would affect another. Because when you do something, whether it's in long-term care or in health care, you tweak something, it can have an effect somewhere else. So this had to be a coordinated effort. So we brought in the pandemic pay. We've increased the, the wage for our personal support workers in long-term care by $3 an hour. And we value them. And we, we have been really so appreciative uh, and, and the, of the compassion and the dedication of the front line in long-term care. The PSWs, the nurses, the community paramedics, everyone who's been really pulling to make sure that our residents get the care they need. And my thanks goes out to them. This but the pandemic a, pay was temporary, was it not? The pandemic pay is to the end of uh, this fiscal year. And we know that this needs to be shored up. We have to make sure that our our personal support workers, our staff in long-term care are valued. And we're demonstrating that with the increases that they're receiving. There's a whole staffing um, strategy, a comprehensive staffing strategy that will be out in December. And it has been informed not only by the Justice Scalise recommendations, which we've achieved 80% of those are in progress uh, and many completed. And also the uh, expert staffing um, panel that we had, that expert panel that advised us, uh, that gave us their recommendations, including the uh, four hours of direct care per, per resident per day, which we've acted on and really committed to making sure that on average, that is our goal, the four hours on average per resident per day. By when? But because of the staffing by situation. By, by, well, in four years, it's four hours in four years, but we're working around the clock to make sure that we address the staffing issue that was pre-existing, because in order to provide those four hours, we need more staff. And so that's why there'll be mass training, uh, collaborations across ministries, collaboration with the sector, making sure that we can create the, the, the workforce that's needed and being innovative, innovative, such as the community paramedicine program um, that has been very well received and understanding the importance of people being able to stay in their homes longer and with the right supports that they need and that 24 hour, seven day a week support that our community paramedics can provide. In addition with the wraparound services of home care, it's absolutely critical as our population ages and we're only at the beginning of an aging population. So not only do we have to address the long-standing issues in long-term care that were neglected for so many years, the staffing, the capacity, you really, we had probably a 10-year uh, runway uh, leading up to this, and uh, the measures that needed to be taken were not taken, and our government is committed to taking those Well, measures. let me ask you about that. Uh, forgive me for jumping in and, and interrupting no all the worries. time, but we've got Go a ahead. lot of ground Go to ahead. cover, and yeah, I just sure. want to make sure yeah. we get to as much as possible. Uh, Samir Sinha, you know well, of course, uh, from yeah, University know, Health Samir. Network and Sinai Health, and he was one of the four who was just on the program. Yeah. And I, I basically asked, um, what's on your wish list? I got a 10 second clip here I want to play for you and here's what he had to say. Sheldon, if you would. I think we have a very dedicated minister for long-term care and I really would just say what's holding her back from, from getting these things done? What does she think that she needs from all of us to get action now? What's the answer to that? Thanks, thanks to Samir. Dr. Sina has been a real champion and, uh, and I appreciate his comments. It's coordination. And I, I go back to we do one thing in one area, it affects another. Uh, and so the staffing really has to be understood across the board. So what happens when we do something in, let's say, with personal support workers in long-term care? Does it have effect uh, on the personal support workers in retirement homes? Will it impact 
uh, the personal support workers in home care. Um, and so we have to have an understanding of how one area affects another. It's critical that we do that to be able to anticipate um, uh, an effect somewhere else in the system because we want to make things better. We don't want to have a, a negative effect somewhere else. There's so much work to be done um, and it's critical that we get on with it. I think to have people understanding the daunting challenge this is and to be contributors to the solutions. It's absolutely critical. We need all hands on deck. This is something we've never seen in terms of an aging population. And on top of that, the effects of COVID. So, you know, we look at all the groups that have, have done such important work and whether it's the, the front line, whether it's our public health experts, whether it's our um, administrators in the, in, the, in the hospitals. Well, let me go beyond that. How about, can I ask yeah. about cabinet colleagues? Sure. Are you getting adequate support from the Minister of Finance, for example? Well, I think if you look at the dollars that have flowed, the, the most recent 540 million, before that it was the 461 million for the pandemic, um, actually for the uh, in, uh, temporary wage increase. Before that, it was the pandemic pay. Before that, it was the 243 million. So it's a yes. You think, at, at you the think there's so, enough money? So, well, for the crises, but we need to understand longer term. It's going to take billions. And I, I championed our elderly for many, many years. That's why I'm here in politics. I, this is There's why I no think people need to understand. You're, you're the minister of long-term care, but obviously you're one of a number of players who, and, and you talked about coordination. You have to coordinate with the minister of health, minister of finance, the premier, president of treasury board. Do you have support from all of those people to do what needs doing? Everyone is looking at the future and saying, how do we make this better? This can this cannot go on. We must treat our most vulnerable people with the respect and dignity that they deserve. And we will we've committed to that. You can see that with the standalone ministry. Has it been a challenge with COVID? Uh, that's there's no there's, it's an understatement to say that it has. It's been a, a, a an absolute um, heartbreaking. And yet, we have to be determined and committed. And I know that uh, people are behind me. I know that my ministers are behind me. Can we move fast enough? That is the real challenge. I, I say it again. We have to move in COVID time. And I say this to my ministry staff. I say this to my colleagues. COVID doesn't wait. A COVID, COVID takes its impact rapidly. And, and I go back to all the measures that we've taken. And when one measure wasn't enough, we've taken another. Okay, can so I ask whether or not, yeah. you know, the, the Premier refers to this command table, the health command table, yeah. from which he gets yeah. his advice. Do you sit on that body? Well, initially the, the concept was to keep any political um, person out. It was to for them to formulate the medical advice and then provide that in an organized way. The Ministry of Health was the lead, the Minister of Health uh, at the top. My deputy minister uh, was on that, but I was not there. Um, but I understand that because you can't have everybody, you know, taking a communication role or a, or a, a different task. Okay, and but so are there other politicians on the, uh, are there other politicians on the command table? At the moment, uh, I don't, and again, it changed structure right now. Right now, there is a, a table that I sit at with the Minister of Health to make sure that we're getting up-to-date information. And I've also made sure that I want that to be a place where we can ask questions. It can't just be, it needs to be two-way communication so that we can understand what's happening in the sector. And there's also the other table, the, the central coordination table, that was really to coordinate ministries. And so I really do believe we're, we're on better footing now. Um, in the early days, there was a lot of um, information coming. And, uh, or, and initially, there was very little scientific information. But as there's a, a more and more scientific information, we've added a, the science table, the, the public health table, the incident management systems uh, table. We have to find ways to coordinate and make sure it's streamlined and quick and adaptable. And that's been a challenging process. Um, I will be absolutely honest. Um, this is continuous learning, uh, but we have to be determined always to make it better so that we can do better and that we can get um, the responses that we need. And, and I would also add to that precautionary principle to anticipate. I think that's really what leadership is, is to anticipate. It's not only to deal with the evidence, it's to also anticipate what next.
Okay, let me ask you, speaking, speaking of what's next, uh, one of the other guests from earlier, Ahmed Arya, who's a physician, I'm sure you've yeah. met and you yeah. know him well, he talked mm -hmm. about the need to create a, a kind of enshrined um, rights of families and caregivers because, mm -hmm. of course, there were so many older people who died alone because family members were not allowed to, to go mm -hmm. see them because of COVID. Um, do, do you think, and we're down to our last minute here, I'm afraid, but do you think it, the time has come for a kind of a charter of rights for family members of long-term care residents so that that doesn't happen again? Well, I definitely think the rights of residents have to be at the center. We Everything we do is about putting the residents at the center. And we were um, really working with the best medical scientists. Not just residents, though. Family advice. caregivers yes, as well. I, I agree. I agree. And that's why I was really trying hard to get them back in, those essential caregivers, really. Um, they're critical, and uh, we know that the emotional well-being um, is, is so incredibly important. It was heartbreaking to have that decision um, to make earlier to, to close down to visitors and caregivers. This is a, a really important point, I believe, in our understanding of well-being. And uh, the isolation that people went through was very heartbreaking, and that's why we've said every resident can designate two caregivers and make sure that they can be trained in the case of an outbreak. One resident uh, essential caregiver can enter the home. They will be trained in the proper equipment, the proper personal protection equipment and the proper measures. Uh, and that's why also we're requiring them to be tested as well. And I know that uh, this is another measure that we have to take uh, because one case getting into that long-term care home can be devastating. So Understood. the essential caregivers are, are essential. That's why we've called them essential. They need to be there. I, I bet you've got other things to do today besides talk to me, so we're going to let you go now. Uh, with our thanks for spending so much time with us here on TVO tonight, uh, Marilee Fullerton, Minister of Long-Term Care and the PC member for Canada Carleton. Thanks for joining us. Thank you so much. Take care. And that is the agenda for Wednesday, November 25th, 2020. Conspiracy theories aren't just spam in your social media feeds. Tomorrow we'll find out about how fabrications about child and human trafficking are hurting real efforts to help victims of actual crimes. Also, feminist and activist Judy Revick will join us to discuss both her memoir and her starring role in a new documentary about her life. I'm Steve Pakin. Thanks for watching TVO, for joining us online at TVO.org, and we'll see you again tomorrow. The Agenda with Steve Pakin is brought to you by the Chartered Professional Accountants of Ontario. CPA Ontario is a regulator, an educator, a thought leader, and an advocate. We protect the public. We advance our profession. We guide our CPAs. We are CPA Ontario. And by viewers like you. Thank you.